would like to introduce uh, Martha Lanning, the former Democratic chair of the Wisconsin Party. And then we have Lavora Barnes, chair of the Michigan Democratic Party. Nancy Patton Mills, the chair of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. And Brad Markell, executive director of the AFL-CIO's Industrial Union Council. Thank you for having us. We can give these folks a round of applause for being here. I'm really excited about this panel. Um, it brought me back to election night 2018. My, uh, one of my favorite moments, uh, one of the best moments was when we realized uh, that we were gonna beat Scott Walker. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and a few hours after that, um, it became clear that uh, we would have um, a lot of great wins and wins across the map in states like we're gonna talk about that really do provide a blueprint for Democrats' path forward and a victory um, nationally. So um, I think this is very relevant and exciting. And I would like to start um, by asking everyone the same question, which is um, from your perspective, where did Democrats improve the most from 2016 to 2018, whether that is demographically or you can answer that in a variety of ways, but where were kind of the biggest um, areas of improvement? Um, why don't we start at the end with um, Brad? All right, well, obviously turnout was a big deal. Uh, I'm from Michigan and we had uh, 2.1 million votes for congressional candidates in 2016 and 2.1 million in 2018, which you wouldn't normally expect. So that's a part of the formula. But for me, I think sticking to the issues, bread and butter being able to explain why Democratic candidates are better for you and your household really was the key to what the victory was. Everybody knows who the bad guy is out there, but the question is, what are you gonna do for me and my family? Okay, oh, Nancy. Thank you. Um, in Pennsylvania, we had a gift in 2017. So before we got to 2018, we had a special election with Connor Lamb for Congress, and it was the first national race. And that really laid the groundwork for what we had in store for us as we moved forward. Um, Connor's um, victory was in a very red district, uh, I think Trump plus um, 12. And um, we were able to test some of the um, issues that we had talked about from 2016 going forward. So um, that would lay the groundwork for 2018. And in 2018, we had a governor race where, uh, that was a landslide for our governor, Tom Wolf, and Senator Casey. And we flipped 11 House seats and um, four Senate seats in the state, and also went from five Congress people to nine out of 18. So we were very, very proud in Pennsylvania. That's great, Lavora. So in, in Michigan, we, we defied the odds in that we ran women up and down the ticket, despite the fact that a lot of folks thought after 2016, the last thing Michigan do, would do is vote for a woman. And instead, Michigan voted for a whole slew of women um, who are all terrific. And one of the best parts about having those women run is that they were willing to travel the entire state and talk about the issues that were important to the people of Michigan. If you've heard the phrase, fix the damn roads, you know what I'm talking about. Like This was an important aspect of, of making that race local and making people understand that the folks that were running cared about the issues that mattered to Michiganders. Um, and it, a stark contrast from 2016 where, frankly, we didn't have much happening on the ground at all in terms of a candidate visit or activity. So um, having our terrific group of candidates run and work hard in addition to the turnout, I think actually helped the turnout happen. Great, Martha. So Wisconsin had a phenomenal year in 2018 for the first time since 1982, any party had swept every single statewide race, uh, which was really exciting. And what made that happen? We really got back to our grassroots. Uh, we wanted to, we invested early in 2017, in February 2017, in a field program that would allow us to organize in every single county in our state and really activate the party's greatest resource, our grassroots activists. And in doing so, we spent less than half of what we had spent on our field program in 2016, but we did 80% more doors. Uh, and what was really exciting
exciting about it is, you know, it was a team effort. Uh, our Milwaukee uh, turned out an incredible number of people that gave our Governor Evers his win margin. Madison turned out more people in the midterm than they turned out in our presidential. But my favorite one, because I live in one of these red counties, is the 19 reddest counties out of 72 in our state. The 19 red reddest counties, if you count the incremental votes that Governor Evers got over uh, our previous candidate in 2014, it gave Governor Evers his win margin. So what was really different is we talked to the people, we listened to them, we heard what their issues are, and we constantly talked about healthcare, education, and roads. Great. Now, Martha, right back at you with another question. Um, you had a big primary in the governor's race in 2018, not totally dissimilar to what we're going through now in the presidential race. I think there were maybe 10 candidates running for governor, and um, you had a chunk of time where you had to keep the pressure on Governor Walker and, and not just focus on that Democratic primary. Can you talk a little bit about how you did that? Yeah, so at one time we had 18 candidates running for governor in Wisconsin. You know, first we didn't have any and they said you don't have anyone. Then they said you got too many. Um, and what we did, what I will tell you is the greatest thing about it is all our candidates stayed really positive. They talked about what Democratic leadership would bring to Wisconsin, uh, how each one of them would do a better job than Scott Walker was doing. And it gave us a great opportunity to have a lot of press all over the state of Wisconsin about what that leadership would offer. And then once uh, the primary was over and Governor Evers became our candidate, every single one of our candidates stood strongly behind our primary candidate, encouraged all of their supporters. And because there had been no turmoil, because we had really been focused on positive messaging about what we would do differently on the issues, not about people, but really about the issues, uh, everyone came together. And with, there was no question that we were all behind Governor Evers. And I think that was uh, the winning formula for us. Great. Lavora, let's talk about field and organizing a little bit. Um, there have been some fantastic efforts on the ground. How do you, as a party chair, make sure that those efforts are maintained between elections and going into such an important election? So I think all of us probably woke up after election day on 2016 determined to not let that happen to us again. And um, the way we did it was grassroots organizing. So we invested in organizers all over the state in a program we call Project 83 which is 83 counties in Michigan, Project 83. So we have field organizers who work for the party full time, not just for the campaigns, but year round, cycle to cycle, they're always gonna be on the party payroll, assuming that I, of course, can raise the money to keep them on the party payroll. Um, and their, their job is, number one, to help us build stronger county parties, because one of the struggles I have is that we don't have, didn't have county parties who could actually support candidates who wanted to run at the local level and help us build that sort of grassroots base and build up votes for everybody up at the top of the ticket from down below. So our, our organizers do that work year round. Um, and the, the, the challenge of that, frankly, is it's an investment. You know, To keep a good number of organizers on the ground costs the party several million dollars a year um, that we have to raise and we have to find ways to raise to sustain it. But it's so important that we continue to do this work year round, not just in the cycle, but all the time, because the conversations our folks are having on those doors about issues that are important to the voters of Michigan translate into the work that we can do for our candidates later. But if we don't do that work early and sustain it all the time, we struggle to lift up something in time for an election. So we've already got those organizers on the ground in Michigan. We've already stood up our coordinated campaign for 2020. We've got a director and several organizers on the ground doing that work. Um, all of it is about investing money that we have to raise to do that. But it's so important that we not wait for the presidential nominee to be chosen, but we actually start this work now and continue this work through the cycle to make sure that we're not um, too late. Because too many times I've heard people in the community say, you only come to see us when you want our vote, right? Which is why, you know, in the city of Detroit, I've got two organizers working there now, right? We're, we're running a program in the city all the time because I'm not gonna show up in that city again and have people say, you never come here until you want my vote. So it's important and we've gotta find ways to fund it. That's great. Uh, Nancy, I want to talk about redistricting, um, a big topic, but Pennsylvania really sh uh, led the way and would love for you to talk about the impact that um, the, uh, the redistricting, the changes or ending Republican gerrymandering in Pennsylvania through the lawsuit had on the election. I recommend redistricting. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Um, we, were, we were so fortunate um, that um, we had elected three people to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and we had a Democratic governor. And when this issue came up, we were able to 
a win. We were able to uh, have a level playing field for every district. This is going to be tremendous for us because in the last presidential election, if you think about it, only five congressional districts identified with a Democratic congressperson out of 18. Now we have nine. So now what we're looking at, and this is how we get greedy, you know, after a little bit, um, we're looking to pick up maybe three to four more. Um, I was actually disappointed on election night that we went from five to nine. I thought we would do, a, we would have 11. And everybody said, Nancy, you won, you won. No, I, I don't, didn't win because we didn't win. Ron D. Nicole, I started naming people that didn't win. So what we're looking forward to is um, gaining more seats. Um, I think that, um, Whenever you have a level playing field, and our governor made sure that it was just that. It wasn't weighed for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It was a level playing field. And we've proved to the people in Pennsylvania that whenever you have that, you can elect candidates that are the perfect candidate for the district. And one thing we've targeted in Pennsylvania is to make sure that we have the right candidate for the district. And I think that we proved that. We started with Connor Lamb, which I mentioned earlier. And this was a real big breakthrough for us in Western Pennsylvania. And then Connor moved into the new district, the redistricted uh, district, and he won there too. This was tremendously encouraging to us. We flipped six um, counties um, that had been for Trump, and that was important. Um, we also um, won in every demographic. Uh, I think the only one that we didn't win in was associate degree um, graduates. So we, we won everywhere. So we're looking forward to more success. And I, as I said before, I recommend redistricting. <laughs> Thank you. Brad, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the issues that you think candidates need to be talking about to be successful in 2020? Uh, well, it's bread and butter issues, right? It's, it, you can't, there, there are things you can't ignore that you have to recognize the lived experiences of women and people of color, right? And the Me Too movement is just really get started where we don't, we haven't fulfilled it yet. We have wage gaps that are uh, gender and, and by race, but talking about working class issues, not white working class issues, right? I'm not a member, I'm not a, a member of the white working class. I'm a white member of the working class. And those little word differences mean a lot. We have to talk about health care costs and job quality and what's going on with my pay. And in these three states, what's happening with manufacturing? What's the answer on trade? Democrats, frankly, need a better rap on trade, right? Uh, what's, what's the discussion around clean energy? It's a huge opportunity. Are they going to be good jobs? Are they going to be union jobs, family supporting jobs? Things just keep circling back to family supporting jobs. I think the health care costs are a tremendous issue that hits everybody. I bargained contracts for the UAW for 15 years, and over those 15 years, I watched rising health care costs just eat our contracts. They ate our wages, they ate our competitiveness, and if we don't do something about it in this country, it's a pocketbook issue that hits families, but it's an issue that hits our competitiveness too. So talking about working class issues for the whole working class, what are the quality of jobs, whether it be in the healthcare industry, or manufacturing is really, really what voters want to hear and how all this tremendous infrastructure is going to be put to use. Right? We, we have this 83 counties in Michigan. What are they going to hear? Hopefully they hear about bread and butter, kitchen table issues. Great. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about Donald Trump. Um, for each of you, I would be interested in uh, hearing your perspective on the role that Trump played in the 2018 elections and um, how it played out in the races that you were watching in your states. Let's start with Martha. So we, as uh, Democrats, we didn't talk about Donald Trump. We really talked about the issues that were important to people. Um, we talked about those bread and butter issues. We talked about health care, um, in particular, um, pre-existing condition coverage. Um, we talked about uh, education and that we wanted to be sure that every child had a quality education. And we talked about the roads. Everybody was concerned about that. I actually had a reporter, a national reporter, call and say, you guys are not talking about Trump. And the issue for us here in Wisconsin was 
people are tired of the fighting about people and they wanna know what you're gonna do for them. And our candidates did a phenomenal job of addressing issues that the president is not on the right side of, but talking about that issue and what they would do about it. Uh, and that really worked. I will say though, when the president came, it was very convenient all the horrible things he had said about Scott Walker, because we were sure to put those out in a video when he came to support Scott Walker about all the horrible things he had said about him earlier. But otherwise, we pretty much stayed away from Donald Trump. I remember that, that was fun. <laughs> uh, so, so for us, I have to say this, Trump, Trump's a great fundraising tool for us, right? Like our our emails that make the most money are either Trump or Betsy DeVos. Um, so we, we use those all the time. But our candidates were not talking about Donald Trump. They also were talking about the issues. You can't be in Michigan where Flint happened, where people can't bathe their babies and make formula and drink the water and go around talking about Donald Trump and not talking about fixing the infrastructure and fixing the problems that are Michigan's problems. So our candidates were very much focused not only on the roads, because our roads are some of the worst in the country, um, but also on infrastructure, also on health care. Um, but every time Trump said something ridiculous, frightening, or stupid, it was helpful to us, not only in terms of fundraising, but in terms of energy, right? We'd get people more excited about being part of the election, but they weren't coming out to vote against Donald Trump. They were coming out to vote for these terrific women we had running for governor and attorney general and lieutenant, gov lieutenant governor's a man, I apologize. Although he's terrific, so. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but they really were all about the issues that were important in Michigan, and I think that that's a lesson that we can all um, share with our friends in other states, that um, you know, the, the, the way to win is to actually talk about the issues that matter to the folks at home. Nancy. Um, I think we had a similar um, discussions, and we've talked about this a lot, that um, our candidates did not talk about Donald Trump, but the Republicans talked about Donald Trump, and it was the gift that kept on giving. And um, the Republican, my Republican counterpart and I happened to do a lot of television and radio together, and he always talked, he had national talking points every time he came on the air. He talked about the caravan, he talked about the wall, he talked about all of these, the wedge issues that we didn't need to hear about. And I was talking about Governor Wolf and Senator Casey and our four women running for Congress who ultimately won. And so we, st I stayed away from Donald Trump, but I let him keep right on talking because it was, it was to our benefit that we were talking about the issues that affected Pennsylvanians, and they are—they do have interest in national politics, but not whenever they're electing their governor, and not when they're electing their Congress people. So um, I agree with my counterparts here that we we stayed away from Donald Trump. Also, great, Brad. The story of Donald Trump for union voters and working class voters is a partially written, half written story of unfulfilled promises. Right, infrastructure. Nothing's happening. That was a big push that a lot of people who work for a living were very interested in. Uh, trade, not fixed. Trade deficits rising, haven't done anything about currency. The NAFTA rewrite is really not finding a home with the union movement. There are a lot of shortcomings around the, the labor chapter and the auto chapter. Uh, so the, the, the sticking to the issues and realizing that all the things people care about, the Obamacare replacement, where is it? It's going to be better. It was going to be great. Protecting Social Security, people, well, the Repu Republicans want to attack Social Security. So though it's the story of unfulfilled promises. So Donald Trump is, you know, in relief up against the things that people care about. He's not making the grade, and I think we have to say that. Thank you. Um, now I want to start on the end with you, Brad, but ask you all the same question. Um, if you, if we could look into the future and see who our Democratic nominee is going to be for president, and you could uh, say to them, this is the roadmap to win in 2020, what would you say to them? Uh, are you better off today than you were three and a half years ago? I think that's the question. There, as we heard this morning, there's a lot of economic insecurity out there. People I know, my family, my neighbors, People are worried about their jobs. What does the future hold? Are we gonna have good family supporting jobs? Can I join a union? As, uh, as Austin said this morning, the best program for good jobs is a union contract. You've seen union density in the auto industry decline precipitously, and guess what? Real wages in the auto industry are declining precipitously. There's no reason for that. So labor rights, good jobs, those are the things that I would focus on, especially in these three states. 
Oh, I, we're welcoming 22 people to Pennsylvania. We can't wait to get all of the candidates here. Um, I will also always um, suggest that our rural Democrats in Pennsylvania have been neglected and that every candidate who comes to Pennsylvania needs to go out and talk to the voters, knock doors, go see people, go to the fire halls, go to the fish fries. And I think this is going to be extremely important. Naturally, you go to Philadelphia, you go to Pittsburgh, you go to Wilkesboro, but if the, the rural areas are just they feel neglected. We've talked about that through this entire conference. We are doing rural outreach in Pennsylvania and ethnic outreach also. And um, we've been successful, but we have not really treated our rural Pennsylvanians the way that they deserve to be treated. So we're going to suggest to every candidate that comes to Pennsylvania and the ultimate nominee to visit all 67 counties. And we'll, can, we'll combine some counties for you. We'll do some regional events. So we'll bring 10 or 15 counties together. But let's get out there and see all of Pennsylvania. Great. So the uh, road to the White House runs to Michigan. Hope you all know that. Um, what what I would tell our candidates is that they, they have to figure out how to, as I say all the time, walk and chew gum at the same time. You have to be able to have a conversation in the city of Detroit and a conversation in the UP and a conversation on the west side of Michigan that is the same conversation with nuance, right? Don't be that hypocrite who says one thing in Detroit and another thing up north and another thing out west. This is how our candidates stumble and fall and get in trouble because they are busy trying to like toe that line and find that one thing that matters to whatever community they're talking to. And I would argue that there is something for all of us in it's just in the way you say it and you've got to find a way to have that conversation about the pocketbook issues that matter in Detroit and in Flint and in the UP and the west side of the state and you have to visit all those places as well several times. So Michigan, 17, 20 times, keep coming. Thanks. So uh, I would agree with everything that um, the panelists have said. I, I also would just really say you need to be genuine. You need to come to Wisconsin. And I really liked Senator Kuhn's quote, and I probably will mess it up. But before they're going to care what you know, they want to know that you care, I think is how he had said it. And that is exactly what I believe is that if you come to our state and you want to be our president, you need to, to, to prove to them that you're doing this for them that you're not doing this for your own personal climbing up the ladder, but that you really genuinely care about this country, about the people, wherever they live, whether it's in our urban areas, whether it's in our rural areas, you care about them and that you are here to listen to them, not just come and stand up on the podium and give a speech, but you're gonna sit down with them, that you're gonna walk to that business that shut down, that you're going to be on Main Street and hear from that entrepreneur saying that I keep losing my staff because I can't afford healthcare and people are going where they can get it. I mean, you wanna hear the problems that people are dealing with so that you can show people that you're genuine, you're the real thing. And when we do that, we'll win Wisconsin. Great, I think we have time for one more question, so we're gonna go back down the line, um, kind of a tough one. Where um, where do you see the Democratic Party going? Where's the direction of the party right now coming out of these primaries? Um, and if you wanna answer where you think it should go, um, that's fine too. I think we're going in the right direction. I see unbelievable energy and excitement. Um, I, I see people, you know, people are so busy just trying to make a living nowadays uh, that, you know, people have a lot of commitments out there and I'm seeing people put the commitment to creating the government we all need to see the future that we all want. Uh, they're prioritizing that and that is really exciting for me. I will tell you as the chair of the party, we need to keep working on our brand that it is a real issue when I ran for state senate, just by putting that D after my name, it was there was nobody talking about what democratic leadership offered other than the Republicans and they didn't paint a very pretty picture and so we need to be sure that we have candidates running in every single seat to really tell people what democratic leadership offers so that we can uh, create the path for our future leaders and to continue to grow the Democratic Party. Um, I think that the, the, the election that we just had in Michigan and the fact that um, I serve as the party's first African-American woman chair um, tells me that this party is 
coming to, into its own, right? We're finally getting to a point where the, the folks have been carrying this party on its back for years and years are stepping up to lead and to run and to win elections, and I think that bodes well for us as a party. Um, I think we're gonna get stronger and better and smarter about running races because more <coughs> women are gonna be running. Um, and I think that we're gonna get better and better at talking to communities, particularly communities of color, because people are stepping up to leadership roles to make sure we do that. So I'm excited about where we're going. I'm proud to be a part of it. Well, I think that the Democratic Party is um, going in the direction of the, the of we see the whole nation when we look at the Democratic Party. We see inclusion, we see civility, and we see a narrative that I think um, resonates with all Americans. Um, our 22 candidates, uh, whenever you look and see, we, we've covered every category, we have every demographic. And I think that this um, will be exciting whenever we bring this back to our individual states, because this will show that our, for instance, in Pennsylvania, I'll be able to show that we are your community, we are your family, and you belong with us. And that's the message that I'm going to take to Pennsylvania. I think the direction is really good in terms of a more diverse candidate slate. We have to continue to move in that direction. We have to have more women and more people of color, and we have to give them an opportunity to talk about the things that matter to families. How are they gonna pay their bills? Where are the good jobs coming from? What can I do to make my community better? Great, thank you all very much.